Hi, this is John Four from RoleplayingTips.com. Thank you for tuning in, and thank you very much for your interest in Mythic Gods and Monsters, my book. Uh, in this video, I will show you what's in the book and tell you all about it, and why I think you should add it to your GMing bookshelf. And at the end, I'll also share three bonuses that I'm adding to the book, a plus one GMing buff, a plus two buff, and a plus three buff. And the good news is they all stack. Let's dig in. So hello from the authors. That's John Large on the left from reddicediaries.com and that's yours truly on the right from roleplayingtips.com. Last year I needed a new pantheon of gods for a new campaign I was starting. The campaign is called Duskfall. It's still a work in progress and it's going to be a gritty sword and sorcery hex crawl game. Uh, and it's a bottom-up campaign where I just wanted to work on the adventure region first. I didn't want to get too involved in the world building aspect. I wanted to get to gameplay as quick as possible, test some things out. So I need gods for clerics and cults and for general world information pretty fast. Um, characters will have gods, uh, especially clerics, will have um, patrons and gods that they get their spells from with portfolios and other rules oriented things and I wanted uh, names and portfolios and features and religions and followers I'm um, kind of fleshed out a little bit for those cleric characters as well but I didn't want to spend too much time on all of this because it's just it was meant to be a play test for D&D 5e and if the game system took off and the campaign and the setting took off then um, it would continue on um, I paused it to run the Fandelver starter adventure campaign while I was working on this so this is still a work in progress and I've needed gods at other times uh, in my GMing career. Uh, there's a classic street of gods from Gord the Rogue books, and I've stolen that idea many times in my campaign. But it means that I need a whole bunch of deities to line the shrines and temples in the streets of a city. And this is from also Lankmar has streets of the gods uh, kind of a concept. So when you need a whole bunch of gods fast, how, do you can, how can you generate them? And so how can you generate the interesting ones all at once? And so I also, you also will often need gods for um, strange gods <clears throat> and, co and cosmic gods and, and unusual um, uh, patrons that are part of dungeons and that are part of villages, strange cults and different religions in the areas, the civilized areas of your world where people are populated. And you'll want forgotten gods, lost gods and, de and dead gods for, and I've used all those ideas in my campaigns. And sometimes you just need uh, a quick cult for a village, and other times you need a, a god for a whole new plane that the players have uh, traveled to. So there are many reasons, uh, at least in my GMing history, why I need a whole bunch of deities at once. But the problem, at least I've found, is that random ideas on the spot uh, type of gods just generate... Um, clones of, of a few small ideas. Uh, they lack a theme and connection and like Star Trek syndrome there is just a bunch of boring clones and the gods become two-dimensional portfolio holders instead of really interesting standalone concepts that drive gameplay in different ways. Each of them has a different effect on gameplay and that's a problem that I've had for a long time when having to come up with a whole bunch of things at the same time. And then a bigger problem is when I started playing D&D 5e, I, I found that the monsters were getting a bit boring because this is my sixth edition of Dungeons & Dragons, if you include basic. And so it seems like the monsters are just another generation of the same old thing. So I wanted monsters that were unique, that had some kind of connection to the unique game world of Duskfall that I was creating, and that would surprise my players and give them uh, new things um, to worry about and to um, be wondrous about. Now the 5e monster manual is great, it's full of lush detail. Um, but again, I just needed something uh, fresh, not the fifth version or iteration of the same old monsters. I hit the Red Dice Diary blog one day and saw John Large's article that connected monsters with backstories to well-themed gods and he had a post about Kalkados the Swamp Troll and how the Swamp Troll is actually a cursed mortal, a mortal cursed by a god. And so that's the exact kind of thing that I wanted more of in my campaign, especially for my gritty sword and sorcery style games 
like in Conan where monsters are legendary and special. So I invited John to write a, a guest article for Role Playing Tips, a monster generator along the same lines and same thought processes and same recipe he used to create this really cool troll. And that went over quite well, so I asked him back to create a god generator. And so that was also a big hit, and so I asked him if he'd be interested in taking on a full-on project with me. And that's the book that you have here today, Mythic Gods and Monsters. So I asked John to write the whole system down, um, from gods to pantheons to religions to monsters. I wanted him to explain in the pages of the book his wit method for rapidly creating um, gods and then generating all of the subset items from that, all the different gameplay pieces from that, the pantheons and the religions and Kalkidos, the trolls. And so I asked him to document that recipe step by step. Um, but because I have so little time, I'm writing the newsletter and running a few other projects and I have a day job and you're in the same boat, you have a whole bunch of pressures on your time. I wanted the system to be fast. So I asked for random tables to drive a lot of the information um, so that if we get stuck for ideas and inspiration, we can use a table to make sure that our ideas are interesting and different from the idea that we just fleshed out a moment ago. And so when I get stuck or if I just feel like rolling, I just want to pick up a dice, note the result and go quickly to the next step in the process. So I don't know if this makes sense, but like a wet banana water slide, I just want to jump into the system and then just ride it down fast, enjoy the ride, and then just have it whoosh me at the end with something uh, that I can put into my game. Fast, fun, and easy. So now I've got gods and pantheons and religions and cults and monsters taken care of for my campaign um, because of the simple process that we've created in the book and teach in the book. And so I can continue world building and fleshing out my campaign, my Duskfall and Chaos Keep campaign and work on the other things like money and um, who's in the major NPCs of the region and the basis of the adventure and things like that. So I've got a tool in place to take care of this particular part of top-down design. And then once I have you know, these very basic pieces in place, like the framework of a campaign, then what I like to do is go to the bottom and I start with, okay, well, what's the first encounter going to be? What's the first adventure going to be about? What are the characters going to do and why is this going to be fun? And then from there I work up. So what are the regions now that um, will serve the adventure? What's in the regions? What are the cultures of the regions? And so from the bottom up, and I've already done the top down, I end up meeting in the middle at some later point in the campaign once the work is justified and, and merited and I can then pace it out. I can just do a little bit each week and develop the major world asset, uh, aspects just in the middle. So I kind of meet myself in the middle this way. And that's why I wanted mythic gods and monsters to do things fast so that I could get to the middle fast. So here's an example from the book. It's about mythic monster creation. It's about chapter uh, eight. John has created a flow chart here, um, which you'll get as one of the buffs when you grab the book. And it starts with four simple choices of monster origin story. So you want a monster. How do you create a monster? Okay, let's start at the beginning. What is the origin of the monster? Pick one of the four choices. Simple. We have uh, options of divine procreation, a result of a curse, it was created for a purpose, or the monster is a small god or similar power. So for Kalkados the troll, let's pick number three, it was created for a purpose. And now we just follow the, the process. Um, this is all written up in the book and the flowchart is just an aid, um, a visual aid to help us guide us, help guide us through the process. So what's the purpose of the monster? So let's pick number two, the result of a curse. And following the process, who created him? Well, the god of merchants. Why was he cursed? Why was Kalkados cursed? Well, he was a bad man who her murdered his neighbor. And before dying, the neighbor prayed to his god to punish Kalkados. So now suffering divine retribution as a monster, the process says, what does Kalkados look like? And what makes him interesting to gameplay? Then we choose a weakness for Kalkados because we want to bring things down to the gameplay level. We want to make things, we want to create drivers for encounters, adventures, and campaigns. We want active elements in our games and things that the uh, players and characters will actually interact with. Creating gods is one thing, but if they just stand back and do nothing, well then that, I think that's time wasted in preparation and your ideas just don't bear fruit. 
they're there in the backstory, but no one gets to experience them or interact with them. So that's a failure in my, my book. So I wanted this to drill down to gameplay. And so part of the process is we choose a weakness for Kalkados. And we decide that he is eternally hungry. His appetite can never be sated. And so this simple design decision opens up a whole bunch of storytelling and role-playing opportunities for you. It brings it down to gameplay. Because now the players have a way to defeat Kalkados that just isn't grinding combat. Or the players have a way to sympathize with Kalkados and try to cure him. And uh, Kalkados could be running around the countryside eating everything or eating the wrong things. Or he may be enlisted to eat the right things. Uh, but now you can see just the process itself gives us these kind of options rather than, okay, he's a troll, he has immunity to fire, and he does a lot of damage and he regenerates. Now we've got this kind of story-driven uh, monster in our back pocket to use. And so this approach also makes monsters much more epic and wondrous to your players. It's not just the fifth iteration of a troll for 5th edition D&D or for whatever game system that you're using uh, that has um, the, the archetypes and the tropes. This is a unique monster with its own background story, its own origin story, and its own um, unique attributes about what its weaknesses are and what it looks like and how you can possibly cure the curse that the game the troll is now under. So our, our poor friend here, Kalkados, although he started out as an evil man, he's now always hungry and he's always acting in the world in your campaign to feed his never-ending starvation. So that's fantastic. So this is why I was really excited by John's initial article, because I, could, I saw that we could draw a direct line from our major world elements, from our top-down game pieces, all the way down to the game table. A god is directly tied to the monster we created. And we created a simple but powerful story. We connected parts of our world together, creating great depth. And all of this translates to wonderment and immersion for our players. And as a GM, that's very, very satisfying to me. So this is what the core of Mythic Gods and Monsters design guide means to me. We create our gods, and then we create the pantheons for our gods, a container for our gods, and that has themes and connections that you can also use to fill out your campaigns and worlds with interesting options. And then those gods get their own cults and religions that we also quickly quickly create using the religion and follower generator in the book. And we can do this before the game and even during the game because we just follow quickly through the steps, roll on tables when we get stuck, and within moments we have whatever it is that we need, a new cult for a dungeon or a new religion for a village that the characters have happened upon. And those religions and cults get followers, and then all of those pieces tie together to fill our campaigns with interesting, uh, legendary, and storyful monsters. It's all about bringing it down to gameplay. So what's in the book? It's 85 pages, 78 of them our actual content. You subtract the cover and the table of contents and the credits page, etc. You're, you're getting 78 pages of GM information and education and examples. You also get 13 tables and generators in the book and it, it's got about 27,000 words in it. So it also has recipes on how to create gods, pantheons, religions and cults, followers, and monsters. And you, while you can go to any chapter and create these things as standalone, we also put them in a very specific order if you're doing top-down design, or if, more importantly, you wanted something that felt connected and thematic. So before you create the monsters, let's create the beings at the top that have the power to create such monsters and discover what their motivations are and what the relationships and the politics between the gods are and what kind of powers they have. And that results in the type of the flavor and the properties of the pantheons that you create for those gods and so on. You just go down through, um, it's like a funnel. And But like I said, you can also just go directly to the followers chapter and whip up some of those guys. The book also serves as a guide to creating belief systems. So religions, they function um, on about, they're all about people and what they believe. 
and things like rewards and punishments. What's a sin? What would they get punished for? That changes how you would roleplay such NPCs and what their motivations are. And so this is how you make your, your NPCs unique and interesting and how you make your religions and gods um, become material in your world and different and, and unusual from each other. They're not all just um, Star Trek cloned races. And so it's also about a guide to creating rewards and punishments, the cosmos and rituals and manifestations. It's also about many other things, but those things I think are like culture generators. They're, they're pillars of how to make things different and interesting. And so you can see how those could then create a variety of monsters. So out of working through those like a lens or um, by creating, putting different ingredients, the recipe um, comes out tasting different um, and has different textures and, and flavors of the kind of monsters that you generate. So this book is not for everyone. It's not about highly detailed DD creation. This is about creating gods fast and creating a skeleton and framework of your gods and religions and pantheons and monsters. Uh, but it does not get into the details of every attribute and their their hair color and, and things like that. So there are other books out there that do get into highly detailed um, 40 field worksheet type of things for creating gods. And this is not that book. It's also not for fantasy GMs. While a lot of my stuff is, um, is genreless, this definitely is skewed to fantasy um, gameplay. And it's not about creating crunch. So it's not game specific. It's a systemless book. Uh, you will need to supply the game rules for that you would apply to the monsters and the NPCs and other uh, elements that you create from the book. And who is the book for? Well, it's for fantasy GMs of any subgenre. So it'll work for mythology. We started out with the mythic um, base because in our history, the mythic gods were the most uh, meddlesome. They got most involved in the affairs of mortals and they created their own monsters. So we used them as inspiration and as a guide for how to make this happen in, in gameplay in your campaigns. So that's why we call it mythic. But it can be used for gritty uh, fantasy campaigns, dark fantasy, sword and sorcery, epic fantasy campaigns, four color campaigns, and high fantasy campaigns. It works for any, uh, the recipes in the book works for any fantasy campaign. And it's also um, suitable for one shots, adventures and campaigns, because this is about a rapid creation guide. It gives you the basics to run with. And then you can flesh things out at your leisure. If the campaign is, is moves on and is successful, um, you can work things out between games. So it doesn't matter if you're playing something long term or short term, you can use this to get yourself kickstarted. And it's for busy GMs and we're all busy. And so that's why we created um, the tables and the generators, but also the recipes so that you don't have to think, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. You just follow our processes and the recipes. And once you've, you're familiar with them, you can make them your own, you can change them. Um, but if you just open the book and start following the process, you'll have gods and religions and pantheons and monsters pretty quick. And it's also for GMs on, on a budget. This is not a $40 hardcover book. So the buffs, I promised, the bonuses. Uh, the first buff is the flowcharts. Uh, John Large has created two flowcharts, visual uh, aids, that complement the chapters on creating deities and monsters. And so you can use these to visually walk through the process. You can also just use the text within the book. But both of these um, are accompanied. Both of these you will get with the download of the book. You also will receive 48 gods. So in role playing tips, I play tested the God creation formula that John created. I wanted people to actually use it, give me feedback, help us improve it and polish it. And so out of that contest and play testing, we received 48 gods and the permission to include them in this book. So thank you for everyone who participated in the contest. You're credited in the back of the book. Um, as per your the name that you entered, um, the desired credit name. And so with these 48 gods, you can use them as examples or you can use them, them as inspiration. So as you're walking through um, the process, you have 48 examples to look at. Oh, well, what do they mean by this? Or how? Do, what are some ways, different ideas on how I can implement, answer this question? So it's a perfect aid to use uh, when creating your gods. And then the third buff is my book, Holiday Essentials. 
And Holiday Essentials is all about creating holidays, holy days, feasts, and festivals. And so I thought this is a perfect companion to uh, Mythic Gods and Monsters because your, your gods and your pantheons and religions um, can benefit from uh, holidays and the holiday essentials is all about driving encounters, NPCs, events, and situations into your game using the theme of some kind of holiday or festival or natural event. There's um, sections in there on creating parades and on what people would do at feasts and encounter hooks and things like that. So this book, Holiday Essentials, will help um, turn all of your, your gods and monsters, etc., into gameplay. And at the same time, you're doing world building. You get to create uh, more uh, details about your world and help create what's different between the cultures by what kind of things that they celebrate as a culture during the year. And um, hopefully, you will find the plus one, plus two, and plus three GM buffs uh, of value as a complement to the book. And good news is they all stack. So all of these you use independently to um, help you get the most value out of creating gods and putting um, god uh, cursed and created monsters in your games. So how much does it cost? The book is available right now. It's seven silver pieces. And with that, just to recap, you get the Mythic Gods and Monsters book, and the buffs, the flowcharts, the example gods, and my Holiday Essentials book. It's available. You can pay by Visa, MasterCard, or you can use your PayPal account. The Visa and MasterCard are, are separate from PayPal. So if you're not a PayPal fan, you can just go direct through um, the secure server with credit card. Just a quick thing about my critical fumble guarantee. So I have this in all my books. If I've rolled a critical fumble and you don't like this book, if it doesn't meet your needs, then just email me and request your money back. I won't ask you to fill out a form or ask you any questions. You um, ask for your refund, I give you the refund, and then that's it. There's no weirdness about it, and there's no time limit. So I'm not going to put in some kind of false deadline. Um, I, I've done that in the past, and it just didn't feel right. So if you don't like the book down the road, just uh, email me back, and I'll issue you a refund. So I just don't want any risk um, to be on your shoulders, because I know it's sometimes um, tricky buying things on the Internet when you can't flip through the pages of a book to see if you like it in the bookstore. So this is my way of getting rid of all the risk for you. If you like the book, awesome. If not, then you have my critical fumble guarantee. So I hope you buy the book. Right now, here's what I want you to do. There's a link. You then add the book to your cart. And then on the payment page, you choose PayPal or the credit card, fill out the payment form. And then once your payment has gone through, you'll be able to immediately download the book and all of the buffs. And you can start working on your gods and pantheons, religions and cults and monsters right away. All you need to do is bring the dice, paper and pencil. So thank you very much for your time and have more fun at every game.